So <clears throat> half the book takes place on an island off the coast of Brittany and I visited some islands off the coast of Brittany and you know bought postcards and things so that when I'm writing I'm not describing this actual place but I'm, I'm sort of describing mm, the atmosphere uh, maybe one thing like I, I might describe the lighthouse or something and I think writers do that you know you you rearrange the world you rearrange landscapes to to make um, the ideal world or the or the imaginary world that you're writing about well this is this is my kind of inspiration wall it's my uh, visual stimulus it's little things that I've collected over the years that I that have interested me or while I'm working I've seen something and I thought that's what I what I had in mind I don't know how science fiction writers do it I mean there you really have to <laughs> use your imagination if you're describing Jupiter or something there's not much uh, reference you can go on it's not, it's not like a science fiction story made up out of nothing. All of this relates to my own, my own life and my own ideas, even though it's fiction. Like, for instance, this little picture here of... It's a painting, 19th century painting by Corot. And in, in the book, the, one of the characters is a painter, and he really likes Corot, and he goes to a museum and looks at uh, Corot paintings. And I have some others here so you know I, I made up a Corot painting that he looks at but it's based on the kind of mood of this one and this one here and um, his own paintings although he's like living in the 60s are, are, are very influenced by him so I imagine this artist doing something like this or you know something like that which is one of my own paintings um, so the the way the, the image connects to what I'm writing about, to, to maybe something I've done in my own life, this is how this wall functions here. So, for instance, here is a picture I, I, I saw in a magazine one day, and um, I think that's in Canada somewhere, but I, I thought that's, that's pretty nice. The way this church sits separated from the other piece of land, and then I was on an island off the, off the coast of, uh, of, of Brittany, Ile de Bras, and um, I bought a souvenir, a little lighthouse, you know, and it's, just, it's sort of strangely, I like the, I like the, the visual uh, resonances between the two, and, you know, you take away the tower, and I can al almost imagine one of my characters living in this, in this house, which I did see. Well, that's how kind of things work. Um, here's a uh, card from the hotel in Montmartin-sur-Mer, where I spend a lot of time with my wife in, in Normandy. And I actually put that hotel into the book, um, mostly because I like the name. You know, it translates as to the good old days, which I think is a wonderful name, or the good times, you know, the good old times. This is an interesting picture. This was a this is done by Robert Young, a painter in uh, Vancouver, done in 1973, and he was a kind of mentor to me when I was an, an art student in in Vancouver in the 70s. I used to go to his his studio and and be in awe of what he did. He was also a big jazz fan. So what's interesting what he's got here is Charlie Parker, and in the background he has a kind of Looks like a medieval landscape with a tower and so on. Strangely enough, you know, here, 40 years later, I'm writing a book that has this sort of um, timeless landscape on the island and involves jazz. One of the characters is a jazz musician. And it's, it's funny, you know, maybe this thing lodged in my mind somewhere. And all these years later, uh, it comes back because I remembered that image when I was writing the book. And that's when I went and looked for it. I remember Where's this painting by Robert Young? I had to get onto the internet and start searching. Half the book takes place in Paris. I mean, I have like a couple of little images, plus the Vosges, which is so typical, like a typical Parisian square in many ways. And there's your typical Parisian view with a bridge and some church towers. This is one of those 
paintings, you know, that you can buy from street vendors for like 10 bucks or something. And I love it. That's Notre Dame Cathedral. It is like the perfect kitsch from, from, from Paris. And uh, so I think it's, it's fine to have that. I really like it, um, even though it's probably really bad. Okay, this is the very first image that I put up, and it's, um, it's an etching by Picasso. And he did numerous versions of this drawing. It's something that obviously obsessed him. I don't think he ever did a finished painting of it. Next to it is another version. But when I saw this, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's the blind minotaur. Um, but when I saw this, I just sort of formulating the book in my mind, and I thought, there are all the characters, you know. Here is the, the tragic painter. Here is the boy. Here is the, the woman in the boat, uh, the woman in the book. She's a little girl here. Over there she has a different, different face and she's carrying a dove instead of uh, uh, flowers here. <clears throat> there are two other men in the book, uh, a musician and a priest. And I thought, wow. And there's the boat, they're arriving on the island. Um, so in a way that encapsulated the whole um, cast of the book, uh, you know, and I, I've always thought this would be cool as a, fo as a, as a, as a cover, but again, it's not the kind of thing that people would go for. I don't think your average book buyer is going to go, that's too weird. I don't have any pictures up here of the characters themselves, of what they look like, but they're sort of little hints. Um, so for instance, that uh, 19th century pencil drawing, or this Gustav uh, Klimt picture of Salome, this um, detail from a, a, um, a picture, uh, painting by um, uh, Ronald Kitai, one of my favorite artists, both of these. And um, I knew this painting, and uh, they're both painters, actually, portraits of two painters. But, so I cut it out and I've written here, Nocturne for Lovers, a novel by Louis de Soto. I've kind of imagined that as the cover. Um, not so much that these are how the people in the book look, but the, the mood, the poetry there, the, the kind of melancholy. Yeah, the book is a little melancholy. So that's something I see. Um, so I can look over here, you know, in the middle of when it's really difficult and things are not going well, and you can look over there and say, well, yeah, I mean, you know, keep going. Eventually, this won't be a piece of paper. It'll be the top sheet on like 300 pages, so you'll get there as a book. Here's a map from 2006 when the book was in its early stages. I don't know if other writers do this. It seems like a very elaborate uh, process here I'm going through. Um, but here's a map of just a place on the island, imaginary island. There's a ledge, there's a meadow, to the priest's house and the dock, there's a little church. There's a tower, which no, doesn't exist in the book anymore. Um, and there's a tiny little figure. So somehow, when you draw something like that, it's easier to imagine. And you know, then you know if the character turns left or turns right or something like that. The reader doesn't care, but you need to know to move them around. These other little drawings are drawings I made myself. Um, at one point, the, the painter in the book um, decides to stop painting. He's, he's reached a point of despair because of a tragedy in his life. So here's a, here's a picture of Francis Bacon's self-portrait. Um, and so I, I, that looks like what I was thinking of. There again, I'm not describing this in the book, but that picture reminds me of what I was thinking of, like a real image of despair, this twisted figure sitting in an, in an empty studio. <clears throat> so when it came for the painter in the book to make a painting, um, his last painting, he makes a painting of just two figures in, in an empty studio. And, um, you know, there's a picture by Hopper of an empty room. There's a picture of Edward Hopper, the American painter, of a woman standing in a, in a bedroom little things that resonate. So I started to make some sketches, just rough sketches of 
two figures, you know, and I did this one, they're too close. Um, they're not looking at each other. This one, something wrong with the poses there. Um, so like the painter who's doing the same thing, I, as the, I'm the writer slash painter. And then I reach this one, just has the right proportions. They're not looking at each other. Um, there's a space between them. There's a window. Then the writing comes alive for me because I've created that image for the artist in the book. Literally created it on a, on a piece of paper. You know, the, the painter in, in my book is a landscape painter, so he has a little box like this, and he has one for his son, so that they can kind of, they can go out painting together. And this is something that someone gave me years ago, but it's like the, it's the ultimate landscape kit for, for an artist. And you can put two boards in there. There's your palette, and then you keep your paints and stuff. And, uh, you know, once you're done, you can just kind of walk away with it. So, I'm not writing about a plumber, I'm writing about a painter, and I know the stuff, and it's kind of fun to, 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 to mention something like that. And I always like it in, when I read books. I like it when characters actually have occupations, and sometimes they describe them. Um, you know, whether it's, a, whether it's a carpenter, or, or, or an engineer, or a, a pilot, or something. The, the woman in the book, who, who, the character, Runa, um, she's a musician, she plays the clarinet. So I had to, to learn about clarinets for one thing. I can't play the clarinet, but I managed to, to blow on it and see what happens. You know, does it get warm? Do the, the, are the keys sticky? Uh, what happens to all the spit and so on? Um, those are the little things that you, that the kind of research that you need to do. Plus, I had to teach myself a little bit about music, like how to read music. So you, this is clarinet solo from uh, Messiaen's Quartet for the End of Time, which is a big inspiration in the book. And um, so, you know, I got a book on how to play the clarinet. I've got other books on how to read music. And just here, so that when I listen to the music, I could see what was happening. I can't sight read, but if I listen to the music, I know now, here, yeah, that's an F sharp that goes for seven seconds, then becomes a B flat, etc., etc., etc. Here's another piece of music that I, that I uh, went into to more detail. This is um, Paschelbel's Canon, which is very easy to read, because it just repeats, like, over and over. The bass repeats over and over and over. And so I've actually written down the notes here, B, F, G, D, E, B flat, E, F, and then B, F, G, D again and again and again. Trying to understand what a musician would see when they, when they, uh, when they look at a piece like this. And if Runa is going to compose, how is this going to work? If she's playing something, I have to keep this in mind, something like this. Um, otherwise... Something fake happens, I think. If you, if you try and describe an occupation, if you're describing a plumber and you don't know the first thing about fixing a tap or something, it's, it's going to be false. And fiction is made up, but it has to be absolutely real. Interesting paradox there. Other than that, I just sit here. As you can see, I have a window over there. You have to stare at the, at the wall. So there's the kind of imagination. There's the real world out there, but I... I prefer looking at a blank wall when I work uh, because, you know, that's the blank piece of paper that you have to put it on. You can't show this to the reader and say, well, this is what I meant or this is what it's supposed to look like. Um, you know, the, the creator, the artist or the writer has to put it there. Everything has to be there on the blank piece of paper. Um, because you're not going to be looking over the, right, the reader's shoulder and saying, um, yeah, kind of imagine this. 